for ghosts. So as I said, welcome uh, to the Scarborough Repair and Bike Cafe. Frank um, is a Kaufman, started taking things apart at age four, building his first radio at age eight, and repairing various items at age 12. His formal education is in electronic engineering, but his practical experience includes woodworking. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna pin him so you can see him actually. Um, woodworking, metalworking, construction, and computer technology. His wife is actively involved in quilting, sewing, and embroidering, and has a collection of machinery related to these activities. Frank has been doing the repair, adjustment, and maintenance of these machines for over 40 years, as well as the machines belonging to her friends. He has been an active member of the Repair Cafe Toronto Fixers for years, working with a great variety of items, electronic, electrical, or mechanical, and fixing things from watches to appliances. Thank you. Frank, take it away. I couldn't have said it better. My involvement with sewing machines started, I don't even remember when, as long as I can remember, there were sewing machines around. My mother was working on a sewing machine. Uh, and uh, whenever the repairman came to do either repair or maintenance, I was hanging on to him because I wanted to see what is going on and I started learning about it. And I've been around sewing machines ever since through my wife, who is very involved, has probably a dozen machine, but a dozen machines around from the very early 1920 Singer machine to a very recent computerized $12,000 equipment. So I was asked to do a session on sewing machines and we broke it into two. One, what we are going to do today is basically going through how sewing machines operate, what kind of machines there are, what is the similarity and what is the difference between them. The next session that we are going to do next week is going to be a practically on hand maintenance, like oiling, cleaning, and minor repairs that people can handle on their own. We'll go through tools, what tools do you need, what are the best, what kind of uh, material like oil, grease, etc. to use. That will be our session a week from today. So without further ado, let me share my screen and we'll get going. Okay, I hope you can all see it. So we are going to talk about how sewing machines work. But before we get into how sewing machines work, I would like to spend a bit of time on why sewing? What are we trying to achieve? And my definition of sewing is fastening two or more flexible materials with a long strand. May that be a string or a thread or a wire, but you are putting different materials together, and these are flexible, floppy, not solid material. Closing was the first item that we believe our forebears were sewing together. They were taking pieces of fur and stitching them together. For that, they had to use some implements. One of the early tools were needles. Now, of course, these needles that they were using were far from what we are using today. They were taking sections of a bone that they managed to make a hole in, or used a fish bone, which could be used as it comes because it's pointy on one end and blunt on the other. They carved some of the wood needles and Later, metal came into the picture and they were using metal needles. The key about a needle, it comes in different sizes and in different shapes. When I say different shapes, it's either straight or curved. Curved needles are handy for sewing by hand, doing upholstery, things like that. 
especially when you have no access to the backside of the material, like in upholstery. The hole for the thread on all of these needles on the blunt end. The needle in a basic stitch is pushed all the way through the material from the top to the bottom. Then you reach under, pull the needle through, pull the thread all the way down, then push the, the needle back up from the bottom to the top, but it is at a different location. If you look at a sewing machine, you realize that the only way it can handle a needle is to go down and up. And when it comes up and down, it's doing it in exactly the same location. It doesn't have the opportunity to move to a different location while the needle and the thread is on the other side of the material. So when the invention of the sewing machine came up, the revolutionary thing in it was that instead of using a single, text, a single uh, thread, they were using two threads, one on the top, one on the bottom. When the sewing machine needle pushes the thread through the material, it creates a V shape. As soon as it starts pulling the needle back up, because there is friction, the thread does not come out, but that V shape opens up in a U shape loop. What we are doing with a sewing machine is take an other piece of thread and put it through the loop, that U shaped part that was created by pulling the needle up. And once the needle is up all the way and pulls the thread with it, the bottom thread stops the U-shaped thread part to pull out of the material and holds it. Then the material moves to the next location and the needle comes down and does the same thing again. This is what it looks like. As you can see, the yellow thread is the top thread in the needle. The green is the bottom thread that comes from a spool that we refer to as the bobbin. And you can see how the needle comes down, creates that loop, and the pointy part of that circular object grabs the end and pulls it around the bottom thread, and that stops it from moving up. The part that is turning around and grabs the end of the uh, thread is what creates the actual stitch. It is referred to as a hook. So in this particular illustration, you can see the mo needle moving up and down, the bobbin supplying the bottom thread, and the hook moves around and turns the loop around and hooks it onto the bottom thread. All sewing machines work exactly the same way. It doesn't matter what kind, it doesn't matter who made it. The basic principle is exactly the same on every one of the machines. The material itself needs to be moved. It's not good enough that we take the thread and put it through the material and then get it hooked there. Now we have to move that material to the next stitch location. It is done by a serrated metal piece that sticks up at the bottom where the material sits. And if you don't have any material and run the sewing machine, you can see it coming up moving towards the back, then comes down, moves down forward, up again towards the back, and it rotates like that. Every time it comes up and moves to the back, it moves the material to the next stitch location. 
the very first sewing machines could only do one stitch. It was one stitch length. There was no adjustability and could only go forward. The newer development on the machines allows adjustability so you can set how far that material is going to move. So how many stitches per inch or per centimeter the machine is going to make, it is your choice. The same way there is on most machines a lever. If you press that lever, instead of the material moving forward, it is now moving backwards, actually towards you. You can do all kinds of magic, like pushing your sewing straight. You push the reverse, it comes back a bit, let it go, go again. So now you had a stitching over itself three times, and that's how usually you finish. Now, uh, I just said, it doesn't matter what kind of machine, it is all based on the exact same principle. It is very, very true. The needle moves down, the hook creates a loop, the needle moves up, it created a stitch, move the material, needle goes down again. That is like that on every machine. However, based on need, there are many different machine types. They are definitely developed based on what kind of bed, so what people are going to use it for, it's more suitable. Different stitch types. Some machines can only do the very basic stitch. Some of them can do a zigzag. Some of them can do all kinds of stitches. Then there are machines called sergers that use multiple threads. And instead of two threads, one on top and one on bottom, it can have three, four, or five spools of thread. We'll talk about that later. Then there are some specialty sewing machines that were developed to do particular jobs particularly well. Uh, sewing machines that shoemakers use is a typical example. When you look at the sewing machine, even though the needle moves up and down exactly the same way, the whole machine looks very different from what you are used to as a domestic or even industrial sewing machine. A flatbed machine is like the one on the picture. The bed of the machine is flat. You lay out the material and it just moves nicely across. It is most suitable for most type of clothing. The other type of bed is what's called a free arm machine, where the arm or the bed itself, instead of being flat front to back, it's much shorter and it allows to get material under it. On a flat bed machine, you cannot put any material under, it has to go on top. Flat, the free arm machines are used for things like making sleeves, rolling material like it shows on the right hand picture, hemming pants, anything like that makes it very easy because you can go right around. Some of the machines come in that format. Free arm, some of them have a longer one, some of them shorter, but you can put a circular piece of material or a roll around it and stitch it. As you can see on the left, some of the machines are a combination. They are a free arm machine, but there is a extra piece of material. It could be a plastic piece or metal that snaps on and turns the machine when it's on into a flatbed. One of the uses that is very practical is the machines that have this removable part. It is actually a storage container and tools, uh, accessories, all kinds of things that you need while you are sewing can be stored in that. Then there are long arm machines. That is a standard flatbed machine, except the 
sewing part where the needle moves up and down and the front part where the transmission and the controls are for the movement are much further from each other. These are the kind of machines that people who do quilting use because they are sewing a very large piece of material. It has to be rolled up and on a standard domestic sewing machine that is meant to do closing, there is not enough place for the rolled up material that is coming through that opening. A long arm machine will allow very large pieces of material to be sewn. Actually, there are machines where the stitching part is as far as three feet from the head. So, as far as the machines, we determine there is a domestic sewing machine, and that's what most people in a home have. The domestic machines are either a flatbed or a free arm machine with capabilities of doing the basic things that people in a home environment would need. Creating, making clothes, repairing, anything like that. The industrial sewing machines, on the other hand, are exactly like a domestic machine, but built much larger. It's much heavier duty. It can sew much thicker material, including leather, and it has a much larger, heavier duty motor, if it's an electrical all industrial machines these days, and I would say 98% of the domestic machines are using electric motors. Then there are specialty machines that are designed for doing just one particular unusual different job, and it's doing it a very good way. It's a very good application. Uh, I have mentioned earlier the machines that shoemakers use. Very heavy duty. Instead of a flatbed or a free arm, it actually has an anvil-like base so a shoe can be put on it and stitched right around it. There are other specialty machines like machines that are used people laying carpet and creating specialty designs. They stitch pieces of carpet together. There are industrial sewing machines that are used by people making suitcases. That has to go through cardboard and a layer of uh, leather and a layer of lining. It needs a thicker needle, a stronger machine, a longer needle movement, but it only needs to do straight stitches. No need for any fancy stitching for that. Those are different specialty machines that are available. Now uh, we are talking about the needles and they are fairly straightforward. The lower thread is handled on a bobbin. The bobbins are a round or elongated spool. The long bobbin was the very first one that the sewing machines used in the very early days. And as you can see, there is a spool, the thread is wound up on it, it's put into the bottom case, which is called a bobbin holder, and uh, it goes into the sewing machine. Today's machine almost exclusively use round bobbins. Now let's talk about that for a moment. The bobbin, and you can see the one in the center, bottom two, has a hole in the middle and it has a little notch next to it. Most bobbins have a notch like that. It's very important because that's what allows the machine to turn it like when you put it on the winder to fill it with thread. In the bobbin holder itself, 
there is no need for that. As the thread is pulled, it automatically turns. There are bobbins made from metal or from plastic. When you look at the picture, there are some metal bobbins here with a single hole with four or six, there is one with three, some of them eight or ten holes. The number of holes don't really serve any other purpose than once it's in the holder, you can look at it and you can see what color thread is in it without pulling it out. Otherwise, a solid side bobbin or a perforated bobbin work exactly the same way. What you have to watch for is they look very, very similar, but there is a slight difference in size. There could be a difference in the outer diameter, there can be a difference in the thickness, and there can be a difference in the size of the hole in the middle of the bobbin. You can buy pre-wound bobbins. They may or may not fit your machine. It's important that you get the right bobbin for the machine. For the same machine, you can get metal bobbins or plastic. The plastic ones are ridiculously inexpensive. I just bought for my wife a, hundred, a bag of a hundred plastic bobbins for six dollars. So that's six cents each. Uh, she has, I don't know how many of them, every one of them has different thread and that way whatever she needs just picks it up. What is very important is make sure the bobbin you are using is the right one for the machine. If you don't have the right bobbin, it is creating different problems. The thread is not coming or not coming out smoothly enough, so the stitching will be uneven. Uh, um, Frank, can I interrupt you for a couple of questions that have come up? That sure, please do. Okay, so one of them, just, just uh, there's several, but I'm going to ask Kathy's first because it comes to what you just said. Is there that much of a difference between using a plastic versus a metal bobbin? And if by chance using the wrong type, but it fits the machine, will it cause any potential future problems to okay. the machine? If it fits the machine, it's the right type. Okay, if it's the wrong type, it doesn't fit. It is not going to work. Either it's not going to fit because it's too big, or it's not going to stay in the middle because it's too loose, or uh, you won't be able to close the bobbin holder because it's too thick. Okay, so uh, it's fairly easy to tell if you have the right one in place or not. While we are talking about that, uh, oh, and uh, to answer the question, if it's the right size, it doesn't matter if it's metal or plastic. Now, uh, what I would say is it's very important that when you wind the bobbin and you put the thread on it, don't make it too loose, don't make it too tight. It has to have the right tension. And neither I nor anybody can else can say to you, this is the right tension. It's something that comes from practice. And I guess, Frank, to, the, to that point about, you know, the tension, is that because the Prafila also had a question about the, the fact that uh, some of her, uh, her, her thread is cutting, uh, keep cutting when she sews, or that the, the back, the, the, the bottom part of her stitching, the backside does not come, uh, come out very well, good. So is that to deal we with We will be uh, talking about tension a little later, and the answer is yes. Okay, what that's other good. questions do you have? That's good. Yeah, the, the other one question was about the, the fabric feed not working, but I don't know if you've talked, you, 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 you talked um, very briefly about the, the fabric feed itself. When that's not working, what is usually the issue? Is it, is it more mechanical or? It is mechanical and we'll cover it next week. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's about bobbins. Now, bobbin winding. 
most machines, or I would say all domestic machines, have a, have a bobbin winder built into it. That can be usually, it usually is on the right hand front of the machine on the top. You have a place to snap the bobbin in. You put the thread on it, loosen the clutch part on the sewing machine and let it rip. It's not going to move the needles, but the hand wheel is going to turn and it will wind the bobbin. Most of the winders work well and it, then they have a little mechanism that when it's full, it just disconnects. The picture shows an external bobbin winder. It is usually used on heavy duty industrial machines. These ones will wind the bobbins very well, very tight, very accurate. And uh, the large wheel on the left hand side is the one that is installed such a way that it touches the belt, the drive belt of the machine, and that's how it operates. You will see this on industrial sewing machines. I know a number of people who have one of these installed on their sewing table on a domestic machine because it goes faster and it does a neater job. So that's one of those options that uh, if you feel you have a need for it, they are only about 20 or $25 and they work extremely well. Now, as far as the drives, the early sewing machines had a hand crank. Those machines didn't even have a hand wheel. It just had a crank on at the front and had to turn it and move it forward or backwards, depending. Then it was replaced by a hand wheel. And today, every sewing machine has a hand wheel. That's what you use if you do a single a single stitch or two stitches to place the needle in the accurate position and test it's going to the right place. You don't turn on any other drive, you just move the hand wheel, get the needle, go down, come back up. Also, you use the hand wheel to pick the, bob the bottom thread up, let the needle go down, and when it comes up, it will pull the bottom thread and you pull it to the side before you start sewing. So this machine on the picture was an early machine that had a hand wheel and then a hand crank attachment to it that was added to it. Inside that attachment at the bottom, there is a large, uh, large wheel and inside a large cog wheel and inside there is a smaller one. It's a large gear and a small gear. So one turn of the hand crank will make probably four or five turns of the hand wheel. That's the way they could make, say, closing and could use the sewing machine and do fairly fast stitching without getting a heart attack turning the crank very fast. So these are the hand crank machines. You don't really see them today, but there are a few machines that you can get a hand crank assembly for. I honestly don't know anybody using it. The next step was the treadle machine. This is the bottom of the assembly. I'm sure most of you have seen one of these if you haven't tried it. We have one of these machines upstairs and next week when we look at different machines on the inside, you will have an opportunity to take a look at it. The pedal is moved up and down and uh, that moves the big wheel on the right hand side. From that big wheel, there is a belt going up to the sewing machine and that's how the machine operates. You can use this to go for the wheel to turn forward or backwards. Entirely up to you. 
Um, Frank, just want to say, I rem I'm sure there's maybe some people in this uh, workshop who may remember being under that wheel while somebody else is, um, is sewing. And I remember as a child being underneath there and uh, pushing it back and forth for the adult. Uh, that was yes. my fun pastimes. We were helping. Yeah. Now, then there are the portable machines. And uh, in the very early days, they took, uh, there's a Singer machine on the left, they took a flatbed machine and created a wooden box and a wood cover, sort of a circular top or semicircle top behind it. It was all wood and you could lock it together and on top of the case there is a handle. That was the portable sewing machine. Things have changed a bit and now we have plastics and uh, on the right hand there is a current day, present day sewing machine that is there for portability. It comes with the machine and some of these machines are like that and this is the only way you can do, use it. Some of them you can lift out just like the old Singer machine and put it on a table or put it on a table if you want to use it that way. I, uh, Frank, I guess one of the questions that I had come up before was about which one for a beginner sewing machine, what would be the best one for, as you know, there are three, there are a few people in this have never, that don't even have one yet. When you are just starting to sew, one of the things that you have to do is you have to make yourself very comfortable. So you have to figure out what works for you. You have to have the machine at the right height. It's like a dining room table. If the chair is too low and the table is too high, it's difficult to eat. Okay, it has to coordinate. Same way with the with the keyboard for a computer. You have to have it such a way that when your elbows are down because you are typing, your forearm is horizontal. That is the most comfortable position. Ergonomics. It is very true for a sewing machine also. So it doesn't really matter what kind of machine you have. What kind of chair you have is more important. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think it's just that it's also uh, for definitely for beginners. You want to you you should start with a beginner or just a simple model rather than the ones with all the complicated stitching and all. Actually, the I was I was planning to touch on that later on, but we can talk about okay. it. Okay, then we can definitely do yeah. that later. Okay. okay thank so you. then there are the fixed base machines. Now it could still be a portable unit, but there is a fixed base for it. And uh, on the left, there is the traditional foot operated wood desk with a cast iron base. And from the early 1900s until the 60s, this was the sewing machine everybody was using. Then uh, developments came in, all the machines got motorized and uh, multiple stitches, different fancy stitching availability came in and uh, the tables have changed a bit. The one on the bottom looks like a desk which has large drawers on the side and if you look at very carefully in the foot opening in the back you see a gray contraption, a vertical piece. What that is, is a sewing machine lift. You can take that sewing machine and either lift it, right now it's in the flatbed position, or you can raise it up and then the base of that wooden base that you can see where the sewing machine is sitting, comes up to the same height as the rest of the desk and the machine itself will be now above the desktop. Just like if you put 
a portable machine on a table. And if it has the removable left-hand side of the end that turns it into a free arm machine, you pull that off and then you can do your free arm sewing. Or you can take the machine, pull it up a bit and it can go down all the way to the very bottom. And then there is a rectangular opening in the, desk, in the top where the machine was. And this machine, it is, uh, tables usually have an insert that fits in there. So by sinking the machine down all the way and putting the insert in place, now you have a table that you can use for cutting or uh, any other activity. So that is the typical uh, adjustable height base. The one on the right hand side is more of an industrial, it's a metal base with uh, the baskets on the right hand side. There is a price difference, there is less space needed for that, but as far as functionality, all of them work exactly the same way. All right, stitching. We were talking about the very early first revision sewing machines. They could do a straight stitch only. If you look at the various, on the bottom of this number, uh, on the top section A is the straight stitch. Just go down and up and forward and down and up and forward. That is the only stitch that they could do. The next development was the zigzag. Now, to make the zigzag is a tricky movement because the material can only move on the sewing machine either front to back or back to front because the feed dog that's under the table with the teeth can only move up, back and down, back forward, so it leaves the material in place, comes up again, pushes it back. So the only direction and the only movement that can do is back and forth. The needle in the early machines was doing up and down and it stayed in the same vertical plane. The next development was the zigzag stitch. In this, the needle mechanism, instead of just moving vertically up and down, it has a hinged part at the top. So the bottom part where the needle is can actually move to the left and to the right from the center position. So if you want to do straight stitching, then the needle stays in the center and works exactly like all the previous single mode machines. But there is a mechanism and it's inside some wheels or cocks that are moving that can move the needle, the bottom of the needle assembly to the left and right. So when you want to do a zigzag stitch, the needle comes down but it's moved to the right, it comes down through the material, comes up, and while the feed dog moves the material from the front to the back, or from the back to the front, depending on how you have it, the needle assembly swings from the right-hand position to the left-hand position. So when it comes down, even though the needle only moved from the left to the right, since the material moved from the front to the back, the stitch itself is on an angle. Now, when you make the next stitch, the same thing happens. The feed dog moves the material from the bottom, from the front to the back by coming up from the bottom, and the needle assembly moves from the left to the right. So now you have another stitch on an angle. The size of these stitches will depend on two things. One is if you can adjust the movement of the needle from the left to right. 
Some machines you can, some of them you cannot. The early machines had only one choice, either it stayed straight or moved left to right, left to right, but it moved exactly the same distance. So you could do a zigzag stitch, but it was one single size. You could change how dense the stitches were, how far the points were from each other by changing the speed of the movement of the material, the feed dock speed, which was adjustable. It's basically the stitch length that was adjusted. Now, those were the early strictly mechanical machines. It had a, a mechanical assembly, a rod, a, a, an eccentric wheel that would move things around. Later, a new development was where instead of having a fixed zigzag stitch, the assembly that was moving the needles had a, let's call it sensor, it had a pin. And this pin, and I'm talking about pin like a quarter inch thick, this was going into a disc and the disc had a groove cut in it. There, these discs were interchangeable and the groove had a different shape. So a basic zigzag stitch for the wheel would have just a circular path, but it was off center. So as the pin was in that circular track, because it was off center, it would move the needle assembly left to right. There, they could then make different patterns for these discs and the machine would come with multiple discs. When you wanted to do some different stitching, you would change the disc, engage the pin in the groove and away you go. You could do different patterns. Then later development came where all these pattern wheels were built right into the machine and there was a switch at the front and you must have seen some of those machines where at the front there is a lever that you can move from left to right and there are the pictures of the different stitches and wherever you set it that's the way the stitch will look like when you start sewing. Those are on this uh, picture, there are some examples of those stitches. The top row shows a bunch of the single stitches. The bottom is double stitching, where when I say it's double stitching, the material, instead of just moving left and right, uh, sorry, the needle moving left and right, the material moving uh, front and back, once you start sewing, the materials move, material moves only in one direction. In those intricate stitches, the material will move forward, make a stitch, move back, make a stitch, move forward again. So the material will move back and forth by a stitch length, and that's how these multiple patterns you can create. So that's how those machines were operating. So these are the different stitch types. Then some of the machines can even do uh, monogramming. Uh, some of the stitch patterns are actually letters. So if you want to put uh, someone's initial in a piece of material, you can pick it and do it. The only gotcha is there is only one size. You cannot have smaller letter or la larger letter in that particular machine. Only one single size. Now, we started talking about stitching and how the stitches work. The idea, as you can see, is the bottom thread and the top thread are interleaved, interwoven, and where the two meet and hold each other are at the center of the material. So if you look at it carefully, you can look at the top of the stitches and you will see a stitch and a bit of a gap and another stitch and a bit of a gap. If you turn the material over 
and you look at the bottom, you will see exactly the same thing. You will see a piece of material and the gap, because the gap is where the two threads meet inside the material. To achieve that is the purpose. That's what you want. That's how you want to have your sewing done, your stitches. If you have a problem, it's usually because the stitches are either all on one side or all on the other side. Figure that if the bottom, the bottom thread is straight and the top thread goes down and is not inside the material where they meet, if the bottom thread breaks, it just pulls out. There is nothing holding it in place. The way to achieve this is by uh, adjusting the thread tension. Tension meaning how easy it is to pull the thread. Both the top and bottom thread has to be adjusted. The adjustment for the top thread is very simple, very straightforward. Every machine has right in your face a dial that you can adjust. There are either numbers or letters on it, and you can just turn it and you can feel by pulling the thread how easy or how difficult it is. The bottom is a different story. The bobbin is in a bobbin case, and on the side of the bobbin case, right here, where my pointer is, right there, is a steel spring. When you put, it's a flat spring, when you put the bobbin inside the bobbin holder, you have to take the end of the thread and there is a notch and a little cutout in this spring and you pull the thread under it. So once it's in the right place, as you pull it out, the thread comes out at the side of the bobbin holder through that opening in the leaf spring or flat spring. The issue here is how do I adjust the tension on the bobbin? There is a small screw called the bobbin case screw on the side of the bobbin holder. And there is a very small screw in there. And usually your sewing machine comes with a couple of screwdrivers, which most of us lose over time. With that screwdriver, you can adjust, or any other small flat screwdriver, you can adjust this screw. It will actually create a gap between the side of the bobbin holder and the flat spring. So if the opening is larger, the thread comes out easier. If the opening is smaller, it puts more tension on the spring. Machines that come from the factory, bobbin holders that come from the factory, are pre-adjusted to the most common tension. I would say nine out of 10 people will never touch the bobbin tension and just leave it the way it is when it comes from the factory. Adjusting the top tension, you can check. You make a test run in a piece of material. The thicker material is better to do that because it's easier to see. So two or three layers of material, run a straight stitch, and then look at the top, look at the bottom. If there is a loop on top, sitting, sitting on top of the material, it means your top tension is too, too high. If there is a loop on the bottom and the bottom thread is straight, instead of going into the gap, your bottom tension is too loose. Usually, just by adjusting the top tension, you can achieve the proper stretch formation, proper thread formation, without any extra stretching. Oh, one more thing, extremely important. The bobbin holder 
is such that the bobbin can be put into it either way. The difference is that the thread either comes out when you pull it by the bobbin turning clockwise or turning counterclockwise, depending on which way you put the bobbin into the holder. It is extremely important that you have the bobbin in the right direction, that when you pull on the thread, it moves in the right direction. If you have a problem with the bottom thread breaking, most of the time it's because the bobbin is in the wrong way in the holder. Um, Frank, would you be uh, able to at least physically show us that or would that be something that you would do? I can and it would take okay. me a few minutes to go, okay. a minute to go and get one. Shall I do that? We'll, we'll, yeah. So maybe we can, can you do a demo later, maybe later after when we're we, planning when you, to have a break anyway, and then I can go and get okay. that. Okay. So I didn't know where, like how, how many more minutes do you have that you want to do? Is there other sections that you're going to do right now? We can always leave that to the Q and A. Yeah, we can do that. Is if you want to take a break, this is a good time for that. Um, sure. I can definitely stop the recording and, and start again in, in a second. I'll pause it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I went and got two pieces. Let me just get myself a little closer to the camera. Okay. I got a bobbin and a bobbin holder out of a 1930 Singer threadle foot operated machine. Here is the bobbin. Can you see it okay? Yes. Okay, there's the bobbin with some green thread. And this here is the bobbin case, the bobbin holder. Yes, I have the same. Okay, most machines have something like this. And the Bobbin drops in, and in this case, what you do is pull the thread through a slot that is in there under the spring. You'll have to bring it up higher, uh, Frank. Okay, sorry. Okay. Under the spring. I have it in the spring now, and as I pull the thread, you see it's turning. Oh, okay. And what I said is I have to make sure that it's turning the right way. And when you ask me what is the right way, I cannot tell you because different machines <laughs> have different. Okay, so this is, uh, now, if you look at it on the side, let me try to get this lamp closer so you can see what I'm doing here. On the side, there is a screw, a small screw. Yes. And this is the metal spring under it, right? Yes. And with that screw, you can adjust the tension. So oh, when you pull okay. the thread, you can feel that it's coming just about the right way. Loosely. It's, but not too loose. Okay, so now I have here a bobbin plastic bobbin with some yellow thread. Yes. And that fits into this very recent Janome. Yeah. First, in a way, it looks different, but it works the same way. The bobbin drops in like that. Yes. There is a screw here to adjust it's hard to see. But the same way, there's a screw here on the side to adjust the tension. And you take the thread and put it under the appropriate place. And then when you are pulling on it, of course, it usually it's horizontal, it moves the right way. OK? OK. This is what you wanted to say. It's important that it moves in the right direction. And how do you know what is the right direction? We'll come to it in a second. 
Okay. Okay, let Wait, me get back. You are very organized. Your, your workshop looks very nice. I try to be that way. <laughs> okay, now, let me go back to where we were. Okay, uh, the other tension adjustment is the foot tension. So the foot itself sits on top of the material. If it's too loose, you will get wrinkles. If it's too tight, the material won't progress. You have to have it the right way and it has to be adjusted depending on the material you are using. Usually there is an adjustment right on the very top of the machine, there is a little pin that comes up and down. As the, move, as the needle moves up and down, you can see something poking out there and you adjust it by the wheel on most machines. And that's how you adjust the foot pressure or foot tension. Now, which way does the bobbin turn? The right way. Mm. What? adjustment do I have? How do I do this? How do I do that? Read the manual. Okay, very important. Now the manuals, when you search the internet, there are people selling them for $15, people selling them for $18, people selling them for $9.95, and the same manuals you can find for free. Manualslip.com is one of the best sources. Okay, so if you don't have a manual for your machine, look it up, get it. If it's an old machine, you may not find the exact one, but you will find one that is very close to it. So I highly recommend it. There are user manuals available for practically all the machines. Service manuals are available for many, not all of them, but many. Okay, feet. There are two or three feet that usually come with a new machine. Where is this? There is the straight stitch foot that people use 90% of the time. That's what stays on your machine. There are no operation that you could not do using the basic straight stitch foot. But there are specialty feet available and there are dozens of them which will make one particular operation much simpler to do. So I highly recommend that if you do certain repeat operations, get a proper foot for it if it's available and use it. You can buy a 30 or 35 foot assortment for $20. It's not a major expenditure. So I highly recommend it. Then there are attachments. Attachments are gizmos that will allow you to do certain things. Once again, uh, one of the most popular attachments is the buttonhole attachment. Many of the machines come with a buttonhole attachment. There is the ruffling attachment. Uh, there are many others that are available. Search it out. The difference between a foot and the attachment is that the attachment will screw on the machine some other way instead of just replacing the basic foot. All right, then there are embroidery machines. They are, again, standard sewing machines with a very sophisticated mechanism to move the material back and forth and the needle and the stitch back and forth. I already talked about earlier the basic monogramming function that some machines have. Then there are the embroidery machines where they are computerized. You can take a picture from the 
uh, internet or from your camera. It can turn it into an embroidery and the machine will do it. Uh, they are fairly sophisticated and rather expensive. If you do a lot of stitching like that, a lot of uh, embroidery work, and you don't want to do it by hand, they are wonderful. But you pay a price. Then there are sergers. A serger is a very, very special sewing machine. It has a needle going up and down, just like a standard sewing machine, and it has a spool of thread, but there are either, depending on the machine, either two, three, four, five, or six more spools of thread, and there are little arms called loopers that will take one of the other thread and move it into the way the others. So let me show you a picture how it works. The needle in the middle goes up and down exactly the same as in the standard sewing machine. But a looper and the metal piece with the hole in it is the one moves into the way and will put a loop of other thread around the needle. Your needle goes down, comes back up, the thread comes in, and not only the bottom thread is caught on it, now the looper brought another thread, and the bottom looper can do the other one. And if you look at it, that thread, instead of going through the material, is going around the edge. So a serger has a knife that you can engage, you can take two pieces of material and put it through the serger. It will trim the end of the material and put the thread around it on the outside. So basically it will finish the edge of your material. It is used instead of doing a proper hem. Many of your garments, if you look at it carefully, that came from a factory, on the inside you will sew you will see these multiple waved webbing. Those are done with a serger. Sergers are special machines. If you are doing the kind of work like closing, it's highly recommended. It's wonderful. To learn to use a serger takes a lot more effort than the standard machine, like the standard sewing machine. And this is my formal presentation. Any questions, please ask. I